Hello, and welcome to week five. We're moving right along in the semester. We've had a couple assignments due since we met last. Uh, one thing that I definitely am going to evaluate more intently next time is the length requirements. It's caused me to think a little bit about the importance of your understanding the literature review assignment. The literature review assignment is going to be one of the most important assignments of the entire course for you. First of all, it's going to be worth a significant number of points in and of itself. And second of all, the literature review assignment is going to go into your research design paper. And so you can't, without making any revisions, expect to do better on the research design paper with your literature review than you did originally. And since that's probably at least a third of your grade, um, then, you know, the literature review uh, part of the uh, research design is about a third of your grade, uh, you're, you're pretty well doomed. You're pretty well doomed if your intention is to get both an F on the literature review and to do poorly on the literature review section of the research design paper. So we're going to spend some time over the next couple weeks talking about the literature review. We're going to be in class this week and next. So by, by coming, you should expect to gain a lot of knowledge about my expectations for the literature review assignment. First and foremost, before you write anything, you should bear in mind that you're expected to have 18 to 20 academic journal articles. Um, if you have an article that is not an academic journal article, it does not count against the 18 minimum. So if you have Time Magazine, you should just assume that I am going not just to be annoyed by it, but that I'm not going to count it. It's going to be as though it's not there at all. Now, on the other hand, if you cite something that's in the New York Times, You'll, you'll, you'll get to evaluate uh, the wisdom of that the next time you take the course. I mean, just to be very stark, don't cheat, right? If, if, you, if you don't plagiarize, you probably have a really good chance of passing this course. If you do plagiarize, I'll probably catch it. I've, I've spent uh, over a decade finding people plagiarizing. I, it, it's never joyful, but it's not especially hard to do. The main source of material from the textbook uh, for this uh, uh, for this week uh, comes from chapter five, where we talk about sampling. And I think this is a really good uh, chapter for you to pay close attention to, especially if you are going to use any kind of sampling as your methodology in your, uh, in your research design paper. The things that people who watch the video on sampling uh, wrote in their reaction and in their summary will be very useful to them, uh, both if there's a question on sampling uh, on the midterm, but probably more importantly, for what they put into the methods section of their paper. As you gather a sample, you want to gather a sample that's going to help you you answer research questions. Now, you're not going to need to do this in this course because the final paper is a research design proposal, right? You will say exactly how you plan to carry out a research design, but you don't actually have to gather the, the data. Uh, this is all the better reason to come up with an ambitious uh, plan for sampling. Uh, but if you were to ask for uh, permission to do a, a research paper, uh, people would expect you uh, to know how to do sampling if that was uh, the methodology that you proposed. So the more detail you can put in, the more you convince people that this is something you're really going to be able to do, or at least that you'll be able to learn how to do. So uh, I would pay particular attention to this chapter. I, uh, I was following through and looking at uh, the, uh, the slides. And, and one of the things that I really noticed is 
that they're really a collection of, of key terms. Uh, some of these key terms are very critical concepts. Uh, ideas like population and sample. Now these should have been introduced to you in American government. Uh, just about every textbook that I've ever seen has a section on public opinion and in that section on public opinion it talks about uh, populations and samples. The population is the entire group that interests you. Now it could be a group of countries, it could be a group of, of states, it could be a a group of individuals. It could be a group of uh, endangered species individuals, right? It, you could you could say these are the 57 uh, remaining snail darters. But probably more important as far as this goes, once you conduct the survey or once you uh, conduct the research, uh, each of the individuals that you actually view that you actually find out information from comprise your sample. As individuals, they're a case, um, but as a, as a group, they're your sample. Now, a sample can be drawn in a non-probabilistic way. You can, um, you can sit uh, at a restaurant on the porch and you can watch cars go by and you can use that to count up the number of cars that are blue. That's not going to give you a very good idea of the entire population of the cars that are blue, because after all, there's no particular reason to believe that the cars that drive past you at, say, Marlowe's are typical of the cars in the Georgia area or in the United States or in the world. You're just passively gathering information if there's some reason to believe that a disproportionate number of cars of different types might go by then you, then you have to then you have to discount the representativeness of your sample i talk in uh, I, I talk in the voiceover powerpoint about how i was once part of a survey uh, on the cafeteria at Southern Polytechnic State University back when the Marietta campus was its own college. And they gave away a free ice cream sandwich to any person who participated in the survey. Now, there's good ice cream sandwiches, but this was one of those ice cream sandwiches that had the really mediocre vanilla ice cream and, uh, and had that uh, weird graham crackery covering that's in chocolate. And, and I ended up, believe it or not, I was like, yeah, you know what, I don't even really want that. Uh, but it occurred to me as I was taking it that there's a somewhat greater chance that you're going to uh, answer their questions if you like ice cream sandwiches. Or, you know, since it was, you know, a particular day of the week, that if you took the classes on that particular day of the week, you were more likely to be surveyed than not. And since they probably packed up at five o'clock, what about night school students? So obviously that's not even representative of the Southern Poly campus. I mentioned this to the person who was uh, handing out the, uh, the ice cream sandwiches. Uh, and, and they said, oh, I'm, I'm just here to hand out ice cream sandwiches. Well, then I did, I went and conduct, I went and took the survey which, you know, if they had thought about it, you know, I didn't, eat cafe I didn't eat cafeteria food at Southern Poly either, but they were making another mistake is they had a quota of the number of people that they needed to survey. So they were getting more and more desperate. And so they apparently let a person on faculty answer the question. And it, you know, how many times do you want to have hot dogs on campus? Not as good as the Marietta Diner, I think I read. Well, in any case, what, what, what you're really, your problem with a non-probabilistic sample is that it, it's true of the people you actually do sample, the people who you actually do ask questions, but it's not representative of the population as a whole. You want to be able to make a statistical inference about the entire population from, from, the, uh, from the individuals that you actually survey. 
Uh, it talks a little bit about sampling frame. That's the portion of the population that you're actually actively able to contact. You want a representative sample, and the best way to get a representative sample is to have every single person within the population have an equal probability of being selected. Now that probability can be really low. You can ask a thousand Americans a survey question and according to applied mathematics, if it's literally true that every person has an equal chance of being selected, you can ask a thousand of them and it'd be just as accurate as if you ask a thousand out of a hundred thousand or a thousand out of a billion provided again that everybody has an equal chance of being selected. It's obviously true that not everyone has an equal chance of being selected. Think about a telephone survey. Not everybody is equally likely to answer their telephone. Not everybody is equally likely to have a half an hour or 45 minutes to be surveyed. Somebody called me just, uh, I don't know, I guess it's going on four weeks ago now to be part of a survey. And here I am, a person who's fascinated, who would have enjoyed the survey. But as it turned out, there was about six different things that I needed to make sure that I had finished before it was time for, uh, you know, to go to bed that night. And since I was very busy, I think I was grading your, 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 uh, your papers or something. That's actually not true. I don't think you had anything due back then. But, but things like that, that I have to get finished. Uh, so I wasn't able to, uh, to participate. Well, so what do you get? You get surveys that, are, that consist of people who enjoy taking surveys and have some free time. Uh, now, I don't think that that's equally true of everyone. Some people are busy. Some people don't like to talk on the phone. Some people don't even have telephones. And all of these people might do the things that your survey is trying to find out about that Americans do. So that's a challenge. Now, there's ways that uh, you can overcome this. One thing that people do quite often is they conduct what are called stratified samples. This is where you have important characteristics that you want to make sure are equally represented in the population. Now, a problem with this is that, um, you know, how do you know the exact proportions? How many, if you're going to conduct a survey, how many more Republicans than Democrats, or rather Democrats than Republicans? If you're the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, do you think that you are capturing, I don't know, every portion of the population equally when you conduct a survey? Almost assuredly not. Well, anyway, the, uh, the uh, chapter talks a good deal about uh, how to conduct surveys, uh, steps in conducting surveys, types of surveys, and I would encourage you all to pay a, a lot of attention into uh, work your way through this, and to take some notes on, uh, on surveys and survey designs. We have five chapters, and this will be, I believe, the last chapter that is actually going to be on the, uh, the midterm exam. You're going to have a question that's going to uh, make you find and correctly cite an article um, that well, there's six questions and you can pick four. And so um, one of them will be this. And, and I would definitely, if you do not know how to do that yet, make sure you do know how to do it because eventually you are going to have to create an accurate American Political Science Association citation for every one of the articles. Now, it's not going to be acceptable to say, well, you know, I. I uh, typed it into a machine that was supposed to give me the correct citation, and this is what I, I had. And I'll say, but if that's not what the APSA style guide says, then, then you know, that's problematic. Um, if you have a question, you know, one of the concerns that I have as we're moving into this semester, one of the concerns I have is that 
more and more, it seems like your questions are going to each other rather than to me. Now, in a, in a, in a greatly troubled world where you are, you know, standing out in the street and you're trying to decide, you know, should I wear a mask or should I not wear a mask? Uh, how do I fix this car that has broken down? Well, I'm probably not, you know, I'll tell you wear a mask and I'll tell you call somebody who knows how to fix a car. But when it comes to what's expected in this course, I might be your best resource. Um, so, you know, if, if you ask your classmates, I, I would ask that first you evaluate whether you think that uh, your classmates know any more than you do. If you're all sitting around and you're all confused, then all the more reason to ask me. Um, but, you know, it's not an excuse to say that Joe's brother, Jim, who took your class back in 2011, said that you usually do it like this, uh, especially when I'm, I'm just an email away. But I think that you should, you should consider that if you, uh, uh, if, if you have done something wrong, uh, the best way to fix having done something wrong is to fix having done it wrong, rather than to, uh, to hope that the uh, spark of mercy applies all of a sudden when you, uh, when you tell me. All right. Um, so as, as you go through this, as, as you go through this week, um, I think that you should already be beginning to look at the literature review, look at gathering sources. Uh, you definitely want to make sure that you have as best the sources that you can. You're going to write up your paper in a, in such a way as you're not just going to give me a short description of what happened in each article, but you're going to be thematic and you're going to be talking about, well, these articles said this, well, these articles said this, and that's why it's safe to draw some following conclusion. Now, for your own research purposes, I did tell you the story about creating the table um, or chart where all the articles that are in most in agreement with a theory need to be placed together. Uh, so let's say you have an article that you begin your snowballing of research with and you, uh, and, and you measure every article from whether it agrees or disagrees. Agrees I would put at the top of the page disagrees I would put at the bottom of the page, recent I would put to the right, and long ago I would put to the left, and all of a sudden you're going to start to see uh, a pattern of which articles say what. Now if all the articles agree, then you're not going to have very much trouble at all um, writing a paper that says that you're going to try to confirm this with your empirical research. You're going to try to confirm the dominant uh, theory. If the articles tend to divide into two competing theories, then it's going to ask, you know, it's going to offer itself as an opportunity for you to pick the one you think is strongest and to create a test of which of the two is better. Or conversely, that you'll try to somehow synthesize the two approaches to find an even better explanation. Ultimately though, you should let the research guide uh, your, uh, your paper. Um, it seems quite often that people, especially at a lower level than you, begin by deciding what they want the result to be, and then from there move forward to determine exactly how uh, they, they, they find the sources that will agree with what they've decided the answer is. And it's, a, it's not a, a bad way to finish a paper, but it's a bad way to do good research. And, and you know, so we're not, we're not journalists, we're, we're, we're scientists, and so we're going to do it the right way.
All right, so I'll probably be talking about these subjects a lot more this week. All right, I'll talk to you all soon.